Okay, now with all that, I wanna set us up because in two minutes, we're gonna switch it over to our first panel. And to do that, um, I'm gonna mention a little bit about Mark Schultz who just popped up on my screen. I can see him there. Many of you probably know Mark. He was one of the co-founders of CPIP along with Adam Mossoff. And the two of them, Adam and Mark, just made CPIP what it is today. Uh, and Mark now has uh, shifted from his other school of Southern Illinois University to University of Akron, where, uh, you know, I have to say we're, we're competitors now, Mark, but uh, hopefully very friendly competitors because Mark is running the great IP program at University of Akron, IP program that's been around for a very long time, so much great technology coming out of Akron, and so he now is running that program there. Um, but he still is able to be a senior scholar with us and remain a friend with CPIP um, in his new role there. So I want to now turn it over to Mark, who will then set up for his panel, the first panel, kicking off the Music Modernization Act. And please, all of you, I hope you enjoy the programming. I hope you understand why we kept it to about two to three hours per day, so we don't avoid the Zoom fatigue, Zoom burnout problem. Uh, and if you have any questions, reach out to myself, reach out to the staff, and we hope this all goes as smoothly as possible. With that, thank you all again for tuning in, and I'll turn it over to Mark Schultz. Thank you so much, Sean, and uh, thank you for the, the warm greeting. And, and I, I have to say, I'm, I'm so impressed with what you've done with this conference, and it's, it's wonderful to see something when you were involved at the beginning uh, grow in, in new and in better directions. And, and I love to see what you're building with this conference. So, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. Um, and it's, it's my honor to moderate this panel, which I think, uh, it, you know, in great CPIP tradition uh, brings in some, some people who are directly involved in the issues and, and really can, can tell us how the industry works, how the law works. And, and so it's just, it's just it's an honor to moderate. And uh, I, don't, I don't have much work to do as moderator because I, I have the experts on my panel. So my job is to introduce this. And so our topic for this first panel is implementing the Music Modernization Act. So the Music Modernization Act was enacted in 2018. And, uh, the, and eventually the Mechanical License and Collective Incorporated was designated to administer the new composition database and blanket licensing system. So uh, our panel will be largely consider issues in the implementation of the new licensing regime and the organization of the Mechanical Licensing Collective and the design of the database and the licensing system. Um, I'm going to very briefly introduce our panels, panelists, and what I need to tell you, especially as the, the first moderator, is that uh, there's no need for long introductions because all of the biographs, uh, biographies are linked, and so I encourage you to go ahead and take a look. I'll tell you who is who and what their basic role on the panel is. The other thing I need to tell our audience is that our, uh, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to have audience Q&A. The way to participate in audience Q&A is to use the chat function in Zoom. So we'll be looking out for your questions and, uh, and moderating the Q&A session in that way. Uh, so joining us on the panel, we have Danielle Aguirre, the Executive Vice President and General Counsel of the National Music Publishers Association. Danielle has been deeply involved in setting up the Mechanical Licensing Collective, and so her role on the panel is to tell us about that. Uh, about that. Um, we also have Adam Gorgoni, uh, who is a composer and the founding member of Songwriters of North America, Adam will talk about uh, how the, the new licensing arrangement affects songwriters. Uh, we have Regan Smith, the General Counsel and Associate Register of Copyrights of the U.S. Copyright Office. Regan will, uh, will explain the role of the Copyright Office in this new regime and, uh, and the, the rulemaking they're working on. And finally, uh, joining us, we have Lisa Selden, Global Head of Publisher Operations of Spotify. And Lisa will discuss how the new uh, arrangement affects, um, affects licensees. So uh, the order of discussion, at least for the first question, will be, uh, uh, as we've planned it, will be 
Danielle, uh, Regan, Adam, and Lisa. Uh, and the first question, and each, uh, each panelist will have about, about five to eight minutes of remarks. Please tell us about how the MMA and its introduction of the new composition database and blanket licensing system is going to work and how it changes the law and music business from your perspective. Uh, and Danielle, please take it away. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, and I'm gonna to apologize in advance. Today is the, as I told my fellow panelists, the first day of virtual learning for my kids. And we have quite a few people here at my house using Wi-Fi. So if I get glitchy at all, I may turn off my video, uh, but that will be a last resort. Um, the MMA, as Mark said, calls for the creation of a new licensing collective to administer digital licenses under Section 115 of the U.S. Copyright Act. Um, I think the starting point should, for those of you who don't know, we'll just take a very, very quick step back. And Section 115 covers reproductions and distributions of musical works. Um, the new Mechanical Licensing Collective will issue and administer licenses for audio only digital on-demand streaming and downloads. Um, Section 115 is a statutory compulsory license, which means obviously music publishers and copyright owners don't negotiate rates for uses of their works in uh, the market. Royalty rates are set by a panel of three administrative judges here in DC every five years. Um, the MMA does not change that fundamental statutory compulsory structure, um, which honestly is unfortunate. But um, ideally, music publishers and copyright owners would have liked to have been able to negotiate their rights in a free market. Uh, but I don't think we would have had the consensus to pass the legislation we did um, if that, in fact, was what we had pushed for. The MMA does, however, make many important updates to the compulsory license um, to bring it into, into line with uh, digital distribution of music. Um, I'm gonna talk about some of the changes it makes and how it impacts music publishers specifically. Um, the system that is in place today and will be in place until January 1 of 2021, which is when the new Mechanical Licensing Collective becomes active, it's called the License Availability Date. It's when it will start to issue licenses and administer these rights. Um, until then, the system that's been in place for many years um, has been outdated. It's led to a lot of issues, especially for digital services um, like Spotify, who have to license millions of songs. Uh, first of all, Section 115 requires today licensees to send separate licenses for every musical work that they want to use. Um, so for digital platforms, that could mean upwards of 30 million works. That obviously led to a situation where services could not find all of the copyright owners who owned the musical works. Where they couldn't find copyright owners, the, the law allowed them to file licenses that were rateless with the US Copyright Office. So they didn't actually have to pay a royalty rate for the use. Um, the failure to identify proper copyright owners also uh, led obviously to the holding of royalties by digital services instead of the payment of those royalties to copyright owners. And so digital companies were retaining vendors to help them identify ownership and pay royalties. There were multiple vendors in the industry. There was not one central place to either obtain licenses, transparently see who owned what, or understand where you could claim as a copyright owner your works. And so uh, the MMA solutions sought to address those problems. First and foremost, as we've discussed, it created a single mechanical licensing collective that licenses and administers these Section 115 mechanical rights. The single blanket license was, would be issued and will be in January to services um, that grants them the right to use all musical works uh, without having to issue 30 million individual licenses. So one license for all covered uses, as long as the statutory rate and some other requirements are complied with. The collective is funded by digital companies that take the statutory license, but it is governed by copyright owners. And that is because I think the parties felt that copyright owners are better able to identify ownership of musical works and also pay out the royalties to the proper copyright owners. 
Um, there's a board with 14 members comprised of musical music publishers and self published writers. There are three statutorily created committees that focus on uh, policies around disputes of ownership, unmatched royalties and technology and operations of the collective. The mechanical licensing collective has to create a new public database of musical work ownership information that increases transparency as to who owns what. And this is a big one because for a very long time in the music industry, ownership data has been thought to be and seen as proprietary and something that you have to pay to access. And so this really changes that model to say, no, the ownership information should be open and transparent to everyone. Um, there will be a portal that is being developed that allows for identification and claiming by owners of unclaimed works and um, unpaid royalties. Uh, there's a process that allows unmatched royalties that cannot be matched by the new collective after a period of three years to be fairly distributed and moved from the digital services over to copyright owners. And that process also requires that at least 50% of that unmatched money also flow through music publishers to their songwriters. And there are audit rights. Section 115 today does not actually have any right for copyright owners to audit the services that take the license and pay them. Well, now there are audit rights that allow for some greater transparency into whether the royalties are properly paid and accountability. Um, and so very, very quickly, where are we as the collective? Well, it was designated in July of 2019, and it has been working very steadily since then to be ready for operations January 1, 2021. Um, in the 12 months since designation, the MLC has done a significant amount of work. It has set up its board and its three statutory committees. It's hired its CEO, CIO, other key executives, and over 40 employees. It's announced key technology milestones, including the hiring of certain vendor partners to help develop its systems, the testing of its portal, which will launch in the next couple of months, um, a data quality initiative to improve ownership data that's already in existence and the build out of a database that it will be using to help match the sound recordings it receives from digital services with the public musical work owners so that it can properly pay royalties. It's begun outreach and education to rights holders and songwriters, particularly given its mission to self-published writers and small independent publishers it is, as Reagan will speak to in a moment, engaged in rulemaking with the US Copyright Office to set certain rules and regulations that will guide the MLC in its development and its operations. And um, it's working towards the operation date of January 1. Uh, and I think with that, I'll probably turn it back over to you, Mark, and, uh, and I think move to, I guess, Reagan. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Danielle. And, and yes, uh, we'll hand this over to Reagan and uh, hear about the Copyright Office's role in this new regime. Thank you for joining us, Reagan. Thank you, Mark, and, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here. The Copyright Office has been very um, playing a role in advising the Congress in the reform of the music copyright laws. So we are excited to see the enactment of this legislation. Um, we had produced a policy report in 2015 called Copyright in the Music Marketplace that provided some recommendations about how music licensing might be improved. And um, this is certainly a, a, a first step. But so after the law was passed, we sort of put on our implementation hats and I'm happy to explain what has been going on since then at the Copyright Office. As far as Title I, the setup of the blanket license for 115, we have sort of three main um, areas of activities. The rulemaking activities that will focus on the most. Um, we're also conducting a public policy study as directed by the statute um, and education and outreach initiatives. So I think if you're, if you're listening to this panel because you're new to these issues, um, I want to, to hopefully plug um, some resources that might be of interest if you want to dig deeper and learn more. And I may, for a second, just take a detour and explain um, the office's activities on Title II, which concerns protection of pre-72 sound recordings. That was also part of the overall Music Modernization Act. 
So um, focusing on the regulatory work, which has really been part of our like pandemic summer vacation homework and in, uh, in my group, at least at the Copyright Office, the Music Modernization Act says the word regulation 57 times, which is really kind of a lot. The Copyright Act of 1976 um, says the word regulate for the whole of the copyright system only 47 times. And all of that is, is basically directed at the Copyright Office under the auspices of the Librarian of Congress. And in some cases, the Copyright Royalty Board, which is um, sort of a sister organization. The Copyright Office has the charge with administering Title 17, the copyright laws. And so that is why we are vested with this task um, with respect to the MMA. So the legislative history, um, you know, acknowledges the Copyright Office's role and says that the legislation provides specific criteria for the collective to operate, but some situations will arise that will not be contemplated in the legislation and the office is expected to use its best judgment in determining the appropriate steps um, to provide guidance without over-regulating in this area. So that is um, our words we've taken to heart in these activities. Um, one of the first actions at the Copyright Office was the designation or selection of the Mechanical Licensing Collective and the Digital Licensing Coordinator. You heard Danielle mention this was in July 2019. Um, this was is set up by the statute with a register of copyrights must recommend an MLC or a DLC, of which Lisa will speak to later, to the Librarian of Congress who will, um, uh, uh, you know, who adopted these recommendations in full. So we had a public process in order to make that recommendation to the librarian and we heard from over 600 members of the public um, weighing in on the various factors that the office is directed to consider in the designation. And so um, focusing most on the mechanical licensing collective, this included being endorsed by um, a majority of musical work copyright owners, as well as showing that there was a technical and administrative um, acumen to do the job, as well as the specific board members as laid out by the statute and incorporated as a nonprofit. So we read all of those comments, posted a recommendation, which is on copyright.gov. So taking a step back for one second, because I think copyright administration and section 115 is complicated, rulemaking and administrative law already you're into like a very dense um, topic. But if there's one takeaway from the copyright office I can give is that it shouldn't feel like a a scary word to say rulemaking if you feel that you have something you'd want to say to the office that we can consider. Um, it's easy to do. You just um, submit a comment either in a Word document, PDF, or you can type it into a form on our website. You can get to all of our activities from copyright.gov. And we really want to hear from you, the public, because that will inform our decision making process. It will give us more information to consider in the administrative record and um, hopefully shape um, the you know, a reasonable, good, workable rule and guideline for this. So at any rate, in July 2019, the Copyright Office designated the MLC and the DLC under the statute every five years, it will need to be reconsidered. So we have a little way for that to go. And then we moved on to um, promulgating certain regulations that the statute is directing us to do. In September, we released a notification of inquiry um, that was sort of a laundry list of different topics um, that we were directed to consider regulating under the MMA. From that, we have published five um, notices or NPRMs touching a variety of areas. So three of them concern information that's coming into the MLC or coming out of the MLC. Um, and those are areas that have been pretty active lately. I would say one rule that is um, fairly imminent in um, being promulgated concerns information that will come from digital music providers to the MLC so that it will be able to have the information it needs to engage in its matching activities and its payment activities and its administration of the blanket license, um, as Danielle and Mark have explained. Um, it also concerns the notices of license because under the statute, licensees will need to file something um, with the MLC, letting them know that they're making use of this new license, as well as other um, information that other parties may provide, including there's a provision in the law saying that musical or copyright owners should engage in efforts to come and perfect their information that they may see in the database um, 
as well. So um, in approaching that rule, we're thinking about how to update the reporting rules from the song by song licensing system that had been in existence for many decades, and also realize the vision where there is this effort um, in the statute, I think, to perfect the um, and improve the data situation, get better quality data coming into this collective, and also centralize operations at, at the MLC as opposed to each individual digital licensee. Um, so we had a host of meetings over the summer, um, which under our processes, we've summarized those on copyright.gov. We can sort of learn how some of those um, issues that came up and the information that's flowing through this metadata that will be reported um, may be relevant to operations. Um, and we also published a, the second um, proposed rule concerns what the MLC will in turn report out to copyright owners along with their statements. And in moving to, to that proposal, we said, look, um, it's, it's clear to us from the statute that the idea was not that copyright owners should receive less information than they were getting. If anything, it should be an increase in um, information quality because there's this effort to improve um, data and matching um, to uh, facilitate paying the proper amount to the proper copyright owners. And we also know that now there's this new public database information in the public database should also be reported to the copyright owners themselves. The third rule that relates to that topic um, concerns what's called a historical or cumulative report that concerns um, previously unmatched um, usages that will then be reported over to the collective so it can engage in matching and payment. We have two other rules um, related to the public database and information that will be provided um, by the mechanical licensing collective, including in what conditions will it provide bulk access to others in the marketplace, um, as well as confidentiality, which is an area um, directed by the, the statute, because as you can imagine, there's a lot of um, business confidential information that the MLC will receive and will have to address. Um, and there is a lot of sensitivity around ensuring that is accurately protected and will at the same time fulfilling the aims of transparency and improving um, the, the data information sharing, as Danielle um, said, so that it's no longer seen as a proprietary issue. So uh, we'll be issuing a proposed rule regarding the database piece shortly. Turning for a second to other activities. Uh, so uh, could one minute, please? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, no, please, you have one minute, please. Oh, okay, sure, yeah. So um, we also have a, a policy study that the, the law app, um, asked the copyright office to engage in regarding best practices for matching and for locating copyright owners. We held a symposium in December and have concluded two rounds of comment. So the next step will be moving towards a public round table, perhaps this fall. That study will be delivered in July, 2021. Um, and then on Title II, the Classics Act, we have finished setting up a system so that sound recording copyright owners can record their interests um, and that users can file um, notices of non-commercial use under that new um, protection um, of Title II. So we have over 225,000 sound recordings, 372 sound recordings that have now been recorded with the Copyright Office. Um, and finally, we have been very active in trying to increase our educational information that is available. This is something the Copyright Office um, has as its mission overall for the copyright laws, and there's a specific directive under the Music Modernization Act, and it seemed like a great time for us to focus on improving the and offering a wider variety of educational materials regarding music copyright. So if you go to copyright.gov slash music dash modernization, you can find YouTube videos, blogs, um, circulars, guidance documents for any way to engage with the Copyright Office if you need to file something, um, as well as we have a web page that has sort of historical interviews with members of Congress that it's sort of interesting from a scholarly perspective. And we know this is a, a rather um, dense area. We have an acronym glossary and we are hoping to, to build upon this and find a way to make music copyright more accessible in general to those who are interested in it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reagan. Um, and uh, next, uh, let's hear from Adam. Uh, 
the songwriter's perspective. Thanks, Adam. Oh, Adam, we can't hear you. You're still muted. Ah, now here we go. Thank the, you. Zoom, the dreaded Zoom. Um, well, I want to first thank Sean and uh, CPIP and George Mason for having me here and having Sona here. Um, we, one of our biggest um, motivations and one of our biggest goals in having founded Sona and existing is to be uh, active participants in all of these conversations. Uh, we like to say we want to be in the room where it happens, to quote uh, a songwriter um, who shall remain nameless. Um, so we, I think before talking about the MMA specifically, I just want to give a quick history of Sona and how we got here. And the, the biggest issue for us was that everyone knows that the, in, when digital happened around the turn of the century, the whole music business collapsed and shrunk and everyone was hurting. Songwriters, artists, record companies, everyone. What occurred as streaming developed, the Apple Store, Spotify, all the different um, digital uh, streaming services appeared and started to help the business to recover, songwriters kind of got left out in the cold. Um, if you look at, you know, the last, uh, you know, five years or so, record companies are now, um, you know, having record quarters, um, artists are doing well. Um, songwriters, on the other hand, have not um, participated as much. And that's mostly because almost all of our income, 75% is under regulation, is regulated by the, the government in various ways. Um, so about five years ago, uh, a group of songwriters, a small group, got together because we were looking at our statements and realizing that even if you have a hit with significant streaming, you're not making income that is meaningful to you that that can allow you to sustain um, a, a decent life. So um, that's how Sona formed. And it started with a, just a group of friends trying to figure out what was going on. We went to Dina LaPolt, who is our sort of uh, legal guru and who we started learning about things like consent decrees and uh, a million different aspects of copyright that we none of us ever knew about. Um, and we've become, in a short a period of time, we're, we're uh, kind of the new kid on the, on the advocacy block, but we have gotten into a lot of the rooms where things, where discussions are being happen, happening, uh, you, you know, pertaining to our profession and our livelihoods. Um, and we basically, have three um, areas that we focus on. It's advocacy, education, and community building. We, we've now got over 600 members, paying members, um, and we're also a completely a volunteer organization. So nobody's, um, you know, we're all doing it in addition to our, um, our day jobs of writing music. Um, so very quickly, as far as songwriters are concerned with the MMA, uh, as I said, it, the status quo ante was, was unsustainable for songwriters. Um, so when the MMA was, um, you know, in the process of being negotiated, uh, we at Sona decided that we would try to advocate and get as many good things as we could for, for our side into the law. Um, from our point of view, the key things are on the performance side, which we won't really be talking about today, I don't think, but uh, previously the judge, there were only two judges who um, uh, adjudicated the PRO, ASCAP, and BMI's uh, rate decisions. And we were able to get in the MMA a rotating wheel of judges so that we will hopefully get um, fresh perspectives on um, on, you know, in those cases. 
The other thing is that in those proceedings, it used to be illegal for the judges to consider what other market participants were making. So the fact that record companies are making way, and artists are making way more than songwriters are making in streaming markets was not allowed, the judges weren't allowed to look at that. So now they are, that's good. Um, and as far as the, uh, the mechanical side, the most important things for us are that there is in fact a mechanical, the law enshrined that there is a mechanical in a stream because there were um, arguments and court cases going on in which it was being advocated that that wasn't, that there wasn't a mechanical, which is a huge uh, win for us. And as far as the data goes, we, um, the way we look at it at Sona is we'd rather have the responsibility for um, getting our data right than having it be in the, um, the realm of the digital services who, um, you know, at the very least are, don't have as much of an interest in getting it right as we do. Um, so we have taken on the task of educating our community, which I can talk about a little bit more later, um, to educate songwriters on all sorts of, you know, the basics. Most songwriters don't know very little, um, so that we can participate in the getting the data correct and um, hopefully getting paid. So uh, Adam, uh, so I think, uh, thank you for your remarks. And uh, at this point, I wanna turn it over to uh, Lisa to hear the perspective of the licensees. So Hi, Mara. Lisa, thanks. Thank you. Um, so thank you for having me. And as the anchor, I've been trying to adjust my uh, speaking point so I don't repeat what everyone else has said. So um, bear with me. But so I work at Spotify and I sit on the board of the digital licensee coordinator. Um, it was started with the five largest DSPs, Google, Amazon, Apple, and Pandora, in addition to Spotify. But now um, we're up to 10 DSPs. And we work together to have a common voice when we are representing sort of the digital services to the Copyright Office and to the MLC. And now that we're up to 10, it's really helpful to have um, the perspective of the smaller DSPs like SoundCloud and also um, sort of like service providers like a media net. It's a it's very complicated um, to try to lump us all together because we have different resources, different timelines, different um, places in the value chain, but um, sort of that's the role of the DLC is to try to get everyone aligned so we can be helpful to the MLC and to um, Reagan and her team at the Copyright Office in um, putting uh, the regs together. So the regs are really important to us. Reagan talked about um, all of the NPRMs that she's released and I'm really excited to get my hands on the imminent release of the um, rule, the regs around reporting. And while we've been working together with the MLC and the Copyright Office um, towards January 1st license availability date, um, there's still a lot of work that has to be done between now and then. Um, having the uh, DSP sort of in the mix and having our voice be heard as the regs are being created is really, um, it's an amazing opportunity for us because if we don't follow the regs perfectly, like there are several um, extreme legal consequences for us. So we want to make sure that the regs are usable, workable, and we have um, a lot more experience in actually um, 
implementing this and reporting and um, creating and, and storing the metadata. We've also done settlements with the NMPA and other um, legal groups. So we've launched and operated claiming portals. So we have um, more hands-on experience in how this works with uh, the different vendors than any, like a lot of the publishers do or the copyright office does. So um, we're trying to be as helpful as we can. And Adam um, just mentioned that the DSPs don't have as much of an interest in getting it right as we do as songwriters. And while of course, like it, this, that is your money, the DSPs are very motivated to get it right. Um, we, at the end of the day, like the songwriters and the copyright owners will come to us because they know our brand name and they want to know how to get the money from the DSPs. We, we do want to do right by the songwriters. So um, it is really important for us to improve this. And we think the um, blanket will be much better than the song by song licensing. And Danielle talked about like converting from the song by song licensing regime that we have now and going to the blanket. Right now we have to, like we are responsible for trying to find the copyright owners for every single song. And it's something that we can't, for the most part, we can't do all internally. So we outsource that to vendors and the two leading vendors in the United States who do this, um, any songwriters or publishers on the call will be, have gotten statements from MRI Music Reports or HFA Rumblefish. And these are companies that have really slim margins. Um, a lot of people may have trouble like just operating their portal or finding their information. It's very clunky for um, songwriters or smaller publishers now. It's like you have to go to MRI for some digital, for some DSPs, you have to go to HFA for other DSPs, you have to go to Google for anything in the Google ecosystem. So I, I think going from the song by song licensing regime over to a blanket is good for the DSPs because it's um, going to be like a very much cleaner workflow to license this whole blanket instead of song by song. And I think it'll be a lot better for um, all of the songwriters and publishers because they're investing a lot of money in making the user interfaces, the portal, the database much more user friendly and there will be like fewer places to point everyone to. So I, I think I'm very like I'm happy with the way the whole um, MLC is coming together from the DSP perspective. It, I'm happy that we're able to have a seat at the table and help um, give our perspective as the Copyright Office puts the regs together. And it, it isn't perfect. Um, as Danielle said, we, you know, we all had to come together as an industry to pass the MMA. So every party made trade-offs, but overall, I, I think, um, once the MLC launches, it is going to be much better for everyone in the ecosystem. For the DSPs, a blanket for song by song, it'll be easier for us to follow and comply with the rules and the regulations. For the publishers, the publishers have total control over the MLC, so there's more control over distribution. Uh, I see some comments. MLC means Mechanical Licensing Collective. That is the name of the new like administration body that's going to oversee all the mechanical licenses. So the DSPs fund the mechanical licensing collective and the publishers for the most part with some songwriters make up the board of the MLC. And so that's it. I'm really excited to actually get to license availability date and comply with the, all of these new rules. Thank you so much, Lisa. And uh, I please uh, remember to go ahead and, and put your questions in the chat. I'm following them and, uh, and and trying to keep track. I do have some follow-up questions I had discussed with the panelists beforehand. So I'm going to offer the, the first one of those. Uh, what, and this is to the entire panel, what do you think the biggest challenges will be in implementing this part of the Music Modernization Act and the changes it will bring? So uh, I guess I can start maybe with Danielle since we haven't heard from her in a while and uh, let, let her lead it off. Sure, thanks, Mark. Um, 
I'm just going to mention, I mean, because there are a lot of challenges, right? When we're, we're creating a completely new entity, um, new law for the first time in this space in, in quite some time. And so uh, there are many challenges. But I would say the two that first come to mind are, number one, we are fundamentally changing how mechanical rights are licensed after almost 30 years. And uh, that requires a lot of outreach and education to uh, help publishers, all publishers, not just small publishers, not just self-published writers, even the larger companies understand how that is going to change um, how they receive what is almost 20% of their yearly US revenue. So it is a large amount of money that they are relying on that has been a pr pretty consistent um, area of revenue for them. And I think now what we're asking them to do is newly engage with a, you know, a new entity, this collective, which is going to be licensing differently, but also going to be interacting with them in a new way in which they have to be more engaged and um, in a way represent themselves on, on the portal with understanding how to go in, register, um, look up and perhaps claim their works, provide their catalog information to this new entity. And so the huge kind of lift that there is in outreach and education in this relatively short period of time, I think is, is one of the challenges. Uh, to make sure that even though we're kind of pivoting in how we license, there isn't a, a big drop off in, or, or everything continues smoothly. There isn't a big drop off in how people are paid or the money that they receive, particularly during this period. Um, the other thing, and, and I mentioned it in my first answer, is the timing. Um, this was an unbelievably short time frame from passage of the law in October of 2018 to having to have a new technology comp company essentially up and running and ready to issue licenses by January 1, 2021. And so um, the MLC has had to make a few decisions because of kind of those timing issues, one of which is very early on, you know, and I say we speaking for the collective, I'm not a technology person, but obviously I'm on the board. We had to look at, okay, how are we going to access all of this ownership information? Are we going to create a new database of new ownership information? Because I think there was a general understanding that um, the vendors who are in the market while doing a very good job with what they had, it was not an ideal situation and none of the databases were particularly strong, um, or are we going to take one of those databases that currently exist, try to, to the best we can, in, improve the quality, clean that data, and then build upon that. And I think because of the timing issues, um, we, we chose the latter, which is partner with a vendor, take a database already in existence, because we simply don't have the time to create something from scratch. And of course, that has its own challenges. And one of that is okay, well, we then have to do some validation and verification of this data, make sure that to the extent we can, we know that it's right. And if it's not right, that we're trying to fix it. And that has been a big push for the Mechanical Licensing Collective over the last six months. And it will continue. It's engaged at this point, hundreds and hundreds of publishers will continue to engage more in what is called the Data Quality Initiative, in which they are asking for the first time, really, copyright owners to take a more active role in identifying their works, cleaning up the data in the database, and working with the collective to make sure that that data is correct as we start to build upon that and build out from there. And so I would say, I'll stop there because I'm sure everyone else will mention a number of other challenges, but uh, those I think are two of the big fundamental challenges that we've been addressing. Thanks, uh, Danielle. Uh, how about uh, Adam? Uh, what do you think the biggest challenges are here? And you're muted still, Adam. Uh, from Sona's perspective, our 
chief goal in working on this, uh, we really have two, but the chief goal is the education piece. Our community, um, we're, not, we're not worried about the publishers who have staff who do this all day long. Songwriters, many, many songwriters don't know the first thing about their data they don't know any of the acronyms. I saw one of the one of the attendees was saying, please tell us what the acronyms are. There are so many acronyms we have on our website, you know, pages and pages of acronyms, just trying to let songwriters know, like, and what is an ISRC? I didn't know what that was a couple of years ago. Um, now I know it's the code for a, an individual sound recording. And all of, you know, and there's there's various, there's a few really important ones. There's that one, there's the ISWC, which is the code for a composition. But um, most writers, especially self-published writers and younger writers, just have no idea about any of this stuff. So we are, our organization is taking upon ourselves to really push to educate, especially self-published writers. We have an initiative that we call SMAG, which we call the Sexy Metadata, Metadata Action Group. And we, we're, you know, because we're trying to actually explain these things in a way that our constituency will pay attention to. <laughs> um, and we are have various things in the works of how we are going to be reaching out to writers because we do think that the um, the blanket licensing regime and the new structure will be better for us if we participate and get you know do our part to get the data correct. If every songwriter out there in the world, even if you have a publisher or you don't, whether you do or you don't, if you go on the portal and you understand enough about what the various terms mean and you make sure that your data is correct and in any place where there's a there there's a conflict, you let the you you participate in the process for how to um, you know sort out those differences. Um, theoretically, everyone will get paid what they deserve, and 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 that's our our goal. Um, the other thing we're doing as an organization is meeting with and working with the MLC and the people building the portal to try to make sure that um, it's constructed in a way that our membership will easily be able to understand. Um, and that's an ongoing process. Um, and we're actively, we're, we meet with them, you know, on a monthly basis or even um, um, more often. We're also uh, having our members participate in the, in the DQI to get the kinks out. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's the, the role that we're trying to play to try to make it work. I mean, I think everyone has an interest in making this thing work as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. Thanks. Uh, Lisa, biggest challenges? Biggest challenges, I, I sort of mentioned a little bit earlier, is trying to represent the interests of all of the DSPs, whether it's a very large DSP or a small DSP. Um, we also have a really short amount of time between now and getting everything up and running. So I think the biggest challenge is like we have all of these developers ready and engineers ready to do the work and the work meaning like changing our reporting, making sure we get it to the MLC in time um, and in the exact format that is required. Like that's just development work. So getting the final regulations from the copyright office and making sure we can get the work done in time, test it with the MLC, and be able to go into production um, for license availability date. So it, it's just a lot of work, and we don't have a lot of time um, left before license availability date. Thank you so much. Uh, so I've had some audience questions, uh, and there's, there's I, I think, a theme among a few of them. I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to sum up. I was also contacted uh, separately by email by, by a representative of the Songwriters Guild of America. I think uh, the, the 
what I, I guess I could sum up the questions is, is some songwriter, some, uh, some organizations of independent songwriters and, and songwriters have expressed concern about, uh, about the process, whether they will have recourse uh, if they, they feel that the, the data is wrong, that they're not getting their fair share. There are also, there's also been concerns expressed about the composition of the board, uh, songwriters versus uh, publishers, uh, that, that they believe that that's top heavy, that it's heavy with publishers. And I guess a, a related concern to it all is, is, is indeed, as I said, what recourse, what remedy is there to make the process work better and ensure that, that songwriters are feel that they're, they're treated well. I guess I can I, I'll, I'll open this up to anyone. I'll let I, Adam start. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, you know, there are, there are different perspectives in the songwriter community on all of these issues. I can, I can speak for what Sona the position that we took during the process and that we're taking now. Um, I believe it was Lisa who said every constituency involved in the industry had to make compromises in order to get the MMA passed. Um, our feeling was that, as I mentioned in the opening, the, the, the status quo pre-MMA was not sustainable for songwriters and something had to give. Um, this law was being um, developed and we chose to participate. Um, originally, there were no songwriters on the board. Um, the songwriter groups who, who were involved pushed to get um, some representation um, and while, the, the, I mean, there are a million things that would be perfect. It would be very nice if, if we weren't, you know, 75% of our income wasn't regulated in the first place, but it is. So um, the, I, it was our judgment that um, certain compromises had to be made. Um, and everyone will have to make their own decision about what was worth it. We felt that pushing for certain things um, in such a way that would make the law not be passed um, would be worse than passing the law with the compromises that were made. We made, you know, songwriters and publishers made the biggest compromise of all, which it was to um, give up the right to sue. <laughs> um, and the law would not have passed, period. The DSPs would never, I'm sure Lisa would, would agree, they would never have, you know, passed this law without that um, coming to pass. So anyway, we're getting into politics, which I'm happy to do, but um, they're, they're, you know, we, we feel like don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. And hopefully, um, moving forward, we certainly are participating. There are songwriters on the board. The other committees are 50-50 songwriters and publishers. In fact, the, the um, uh, what do they call it? The UROC, Unclaimed Royalties. Um, they're 50% writers and 50% uh, independent publishers. So there are no major publishers on that committee. Um, we are going to do our due diligence um, to try to make absolutely sure that songwriters are treated fairly. And when we disagree with any of the other players, we're going to fight. Um, and, and can I just quickly, just to follow up on that, because I, I agree with what Adam said. And um, I think, you know, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good could be the mantra for all of us on this panel, because that really needed to. The, the consensus that we had to build in order to pass the law required compromise from every uh, different constituency. And uh, we, we would not have a law, which I do think significantly improves uh, this part of the industry and this licensing process for everyone overall. We would not have that if any of us stood and said, we refuse to compromise and we, are, we require everything that we're asking for. And, and that includes publishers as well. Um, but I will say in terms of the question about recourse, um, I think 
what we all felt was what was lacking um, in Section 115 licensing was transparency. And that is a theme that runs through uh, what the MLC does, whether it's providing a public database, providing a portal where you can see your own works, ensuring that 50% of the royalties from unmatched works flow through to songwriters, and then providing audit rights, as I said before, but not just the right of the collective to audit the digital services, but the right of copyright owners who use the collective to audit the collective itself. And so I think that the recourse was with, you know, part of that was let's open this up and let the light in. Let's, let's make sure people can see what's happening. Let's make sure there are reporting requirements by the mechanical licensing collective. Let's make sure the copyright office has a real oversight role, which um, of course we, we all agreed to when, when, as we were negotiating, you know, this law. And so I think all of that together provides for recourse, but also transparency so that I hope people feel like there's no need for recourse because they can see what's happening as it's happening and feel comfortable with how the collective is handling certain issues and, and handling the royalties. Thanks, Danielle. Lisa, do you have uh, anything you'd like to contribute? Uh, maybe Regan, do you have uh, something you'd like to contribute? I do, but if Lisa would like to first, I didn't want to step over her. Yeah, I wasn't sure if Lisa, Lisa, you're available? Hi. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, Hi. Um, so yeah, I agree with a lot of what um, Danielle said about um, more transparency with the MLC. And I think, you know, Reagan talked about education and outreach, like part of um, the statute talks about or like requires the services to have education and outreach also. So we're going to do whatever we can um, and help sort of explain what the MLC is and get small publishers, songwriters, like explain what they have to do in order to get their royalties. I, I think they're like we won't control um, the digital services don't control how the MLC distributes money and what they do with conflicts like all of that is within the MLC world but from the DSP side we think there will be a lot more transparency the, the user experience will be a lot better so like Danielle said like if if you're able to see how everything is being calculated how the money flows the and everything will be more efficient. Hopefully there will be less questions and less suspicion and less black box. What are you doing with my money? You, the copyright owners will be able to see exactly how the money was calculated, where it flowed from, which services are providing what. So there will be a lot more transparency. And I, I think the MLC's user interface is going to be very, very um, friend, user friendly and it'll be easy for the copyright owners to understand and see what's going on and how they're earning their money. Thanks, Danielle. Reagan, um, any thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, I just wanted to add um, from a government perspective, the Copyright Office um, certainly does have a role in oversight. We're not, we're not stepping in the shoes of the MLC. The MLC has very specific duties that it needs to do as does the DLC. And I think if there's, if you're wondering what that is and how does the statute work, we've tried to explain this in some documents for the designation of the MLC, as well as a notification of inquiry about transparency and about whether um, there should be additional regulatory activities to ensure proper recourse and oversight. Um, and I know you said maybe SGA asked you that question. They've participated in these proceedings, as says Sona, um, to hear from songwriters, which I think has been helpful. So Danielle um, did a good job outlining how the statute sets up um, some oversight of the MLC through annual reporting or through auditing. Um, the Copyright Office has its role too through this redesignation process every five years and its regulatory authority. If you are interested in that issue, our proposed rule on transparency and whether there should be any types of additional disclosure will be one that you can comment um, on shortly, but you need to do it through the proper channels for the Copyright Office to consider it. That's, I mean, that's how the process of government works. And that's why I'm, I'm saying this to not make it scary, but if you want to be heard, you need to sort of get in the same way everyone gets in so that it can be an even um, playing field 
for everyone. And finally, I would say the policy study is probably another opportunity um, so to have us consider if there's something that you think um, we should hear um, in our role. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so our time is almost up and, and some of our attendees had some, a few basic factual questions that I think are probably interesting to the audience. So I'm gonna uh, offer all three of them just for quick answers. Uh, one one is, is wondering, uh, if the data in the MLC database will be uh, available to the public, uh, will it be searchable only song by song or will wholesale data industry wide be made available? Uh, so there's curiosity just as to who has access to the data. Second question, will any of this affect or improve the process for individual entities, not DSPs to obtain licenses for use of songs or sound recordings digitally? Third question, do we have any idea how much money will flow through the MLC once it's fully up and running? So anyone who wants to answer those th three factual questions, I think would be of interest. Who, uh, Danielle, yeah, okay, yeah. I can, just, I can answer the, just, it, just going backwards, the third question, it, um, we, don't, we don't know fully right now because under the MMA, uh, Entities can still obviously enter into voluntary licenses. So if there's a digital service and um, a copyright owner who, are, who would like to do their own license outside of the mechanical licensing collective, they don't have to. Today, you don't have to take the statutory license and that continues. You uh, don't ever have to take the statutory license. You can, so you can do a voluntary license. And so until I think the mechanical licensing collective um, gets a sense of kind of, kind of what the voluntary licenses are in the market today, what they may be going into the future when the after the license availability data would they'll have a better sense of um, how much money will be flowing through the collective versus through voluntary licenses. Now that said, the, the mechanical licensing collective gets information even about voluntary licenses so that it understands what it shouldn't be paying, right? So it has to know this is what we're matching from the reporting we're getting from the services, and this is how much in royalties we need to now ask the digital services for so that we can pay that out properly. And we also have to know of this reporting, what of this is part of a voluntary license so that we don't have to um, ask for those royalties and pay that out because that's being paid out privately through through a separate license. But but in terms of how much will, money will actually flow through, I think that depends. And I and I know that Lisa can speak to this. That I know there were discussions between the MLC and the services already to try to start to lay out the landscape so that everybody understands um, how how the MLC will interact and and what voluntary licenses are already out there now, which will continue after the license availability date. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I, I, one of my jobs as moderator is to keep us in time. So I'll have to wrap this up. I have to thank our panelists and uh, offer some virtual applause. Uh, if you were together in a room, there'd be a lot, a lot more of that. Uh, and, uh, and I thank you so much for an enlightening panel and for your participation. And I guess I hand this back over to, it looks like Sean's uh, popping up here to, to take back over. So, so thank you so much. Thank you. Popping right. back Thanks. Up. Thanks, Mark. Mark, thank you so much. Thanks all the panelists. Adam, before you disappear, I noticed that ES-335 behind you looked like a very nice guitar. We'll have to play together at some point. We're gonna take a break now and we will reconvene at 12 o'clock so everyone can run off and do what you need to do. And we'll see you back here at 12 o'clock for a deeper dive on sound recording rights. Thanks again to everyone. See you soon. Bye.